Our Lord constantly insisted that you cannot get into heaven <laughs> unless you have a mind of a little child. <laughs> In God's plan uh, is that he becomes a child of Mary. Uh, it's a very uh, engaging concept and the mission of Mary is to make is to help people to be have a child a, a faith huh? the faith of a child of a little child and she is uh, devotion to Mary is precisely that yeah and the Marian is that's the mission of the Marianists, the mission of Mary. You know, this past summer, I had an opportunity to make the uh, Spirit of Saragossa retreat, which is a 30-day retreat on around the Marianist charism. And during that retreat, I was doing some reading of Pope Francis and some of our own Marianist charism. And one of the things I discovered was that Pope Francis had this dedication to Mary on tire of knots, and as I worked through that image, through my prayer and reflection, I saw how powerful that image was. Not only did she help you untie the knots of your own personal sinfulness, but the knots that are in our personal relationship. And for me, working at social justice issues, it also said she can be a person who helps us untie the knots of, of our social structures and our culture. I would say the thing that I'm most grateful for is the love and the guidance and the inspiration of Mary, the mother of Jesus. I think one of my inspirations comes from uh, the story of the visitation in the Gospel of Luke. And when Mary arrives at the home of her cousin Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth turns to her and says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And, and I felt that in my experience of Marianist religious life. Who am I that, that I should be invited by the mother of Jesus? Uh, to serve her son. And ways that I've been guided by the example of Mary's faith and hope, her fidelity, her courage, her trust in God, uh, it's just really touched my life deeply. And I've seen it move in the lives of people that I've come to know and the experience of Marianist brothers and sisters and Marianist lay people, uh, people that I've been in ministry with and to. Uh, just her inspiration, her guidance, I think in my Marianist life, Mary is, is who and what I'm most grateful for. One of the most blessed things that has ever happened to me in uh, the Society of Mary in the province of St. Louis, which I was from, was a negative thing. I've thought about it a little bit, and this is the one I wanted to pick and to speak about a little bit. I was novice master in our province for, I was assigned, a, given that task for five years. And after four years, because of various circumstances, the province administration said, that's it, Father, we're going to appoint someone else. So I was relieved of that job. and. It was a very difficult moment in my life. Some people thought I was going to leave the society. Never crossed my mind. However, that uh, stumbling block drew out of me an awareness of an ego, sides of my ego, that I wasn't very aware of. And I had to deal with that. And through ups and downs for the next few years, I did deal with it with help and with God's grace. And I think that negative moment has deepened me and purified me and been a blessing, a great blessing in my life. I had to readjust and rethink, all right, why are you here? Why does it offend you so much that you have been relieved of a task? So I was a freer, truer, deeper Marianist after that. And it has been a blessing all these years. That was a long time ago that that happened. 
Well, I'm most grateful that I got in. When I was a young brother, after you go out teaching the first year, then you can apply for perpetual vows, for, you know, for perpetual membership. And so I applied. I was at St. Mary's High School, and I applied after my first year of teaching. And the letter came back, no, you're not ready. And uh, we suggest either you go to a diocese or you stay one more year and try again. So I said, whoa, I didn't think about that. So I said, I'm going to try again. So I had my second year there at St. Mary's again. And they said, you know, I was timid and didn't show leadership. So I tried to get involved in things. I had got a Sedali going, and I got this and that. And uh, uh, wrote again at the end of the second year and they said well okay you, you can have vows but you can't have the priesthood we don't think you make a good Marianist priest so if you want to try again or if you want to go to a diocese whatever you want to do so I'll stay again so I th third year tried again in my third year I got perpetual vows and I got permission to go to the priesthood after my five years of teaching and so I, I was always grateful that uh, Enough, not enough brothers voted for me that I got accepted. I after, even though it was after three tries, I was glad to be, become a Marianist. It was, it was worth the effort. From the very beginning, priests and brothers in the Society of Mary were equal. And, and that does, does not exist. It's coming now at this day and age in most religious orders. You know, We truly have been equal. You get a job because of your ability, not because you, you're wearing the Roman collar. And uh, sometimes the Roman collar is there because that man has the ability. And sometimes it's a, it's a religious, a brother, you know, who's the superior. I think this, this is, and, and where it's really progressed is into our relationship with lay people. We consider them equals, you know, we don't want to uh, tell them what to do. We want to work with them, you know, and we want to listen to them and respond to them, uh, work with them as equals. I remember years ago, I went to chapel and I just uh, thanked the Lord that I have a vocation to the Marianist and that, that I got to know all these good men and live with them. You know, uh, what a blessing it was, what a blessing it is. I was a teacher, I was a counselor, and I was a coach. But one time when uh, these two girls came from uh, Washington, D.C., their dad was transferred into Wright Pat. And um, they lived down town right near the school when they came to the school. And, and they were not Catholics, but they came in and, and, and they became great friends of mine. Um, about five years ago, I got a, a letter from the one girl and she said that she and her sister had become converted. And uh, she said it was one of the reasons was because uh, I was so friendly, but they were, they were just cute kids, you know. But that was, but there are many blessed moments and I can't, you know, I, um, I can't, sometimes I can't figure them out. There is no such thing as Marianist life without community. Uh, that is a core to everything. Uh, and it's a very important thing because there is no success in any part of society without community. There is no success in the church without community. And Marianne's life is nothing but community. It's community with, uh, among ourselves. It's community with lay people. Uh, we teach community. Uh, it's absolutely essential. There's nothing better than to work with other people uh, on a spiritual level. A blessed moment? I would have to say there's more than one. <laughs> it is really hard to, uh, to pick out just one. One particular one uh, that I would look at is 
when they asked me to be assistant director of novices and then director of novices, that that was why am I so honored to walk with other young men and older men who are saying, I think God is calling me to this Marianist life and I get to walk with them and help them with prayer, help them with the Marianist charism spirit, history of religious life, living in community, and what does all that mean? And so spending that time with them in, in prayer and in community and in our classes, and as they kind of struggled with their uh, decision to, uh, to say, this is what I think God is calling me to, there is no other greater <laughs> uh, experience that I can think of where um, it's like, God, you have blessed me and I feel so humbled in this position. Maybe a bit flippantly, I'd like the world to know uh, that uh, Marianist life is like church life ought to be. Uh, it's a, a life in community. It's a, a life of uh, equals, but a lot of diversity. Uh, it's, it's a life where uh, we not only live together, but we, we work together. And uh, I think that's been kind of characteristic of our Marianist communities uh, over the years. And also, uh, it's uh, something that today uh, really enhances our, our life and our ministry. I think the, also I would consider my opportunity to be in Mexico for about 20 years. And being able to serve in Mexico as a, as a teacher again, uh, as a missionary in a certain way, to learn to speak Spanish and to use Spanish and to teach in Spanish uh, was one of the, I think I'm very grateful for those years. Learn how respected we are Americans and how wonderful the Mexican people are and how helpful they are and how obedient. Those were some of the best classes I had was down in Mexico with those young guys. When I find myself uh, praying the rosary, it's the very first one of the joyful mysteries, which has the most importance to me. And so the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary. And I find great inspiration from that because it's a witness of God being proactive and taking the first step to interact with somebody and interact in their life. And that's a very, very different than the burden is on us to interact with God. It's really God, is, He's doing it first and we need to respond to that. And so Mary is a powerful witness of that whole interchange or exchange with God. And so when I look at my life and figure out my vocation, I understand it as I'm responding to something that God had initiated in the very first place. And then I have the opportunity to choose how I want to respond to that. Mary had that same opportunity. She was able to say yes. I had the opportunity to say yes. And then once I said yes, uh, then it's m my responsibility to keep my heart open to when God may next speak to me so that I can respond again. So it's a back and forth interchange. And that's how I understand my life. The role of Mary in my life, well, uh, right now I guess it's uh, striving to have what they call the presence of Mary in your life, and that means that your prayer is uh, always within her company. So I try to, as Blessed Shamanad told us, to begin our meditation with the presence of Mary in the room with you as you start to meditate or look at Scripture and reflect on it. So she's there with me. And I try to recall that as often as I can during the day with some of the Marian prayers, stop in the chapel once or twice during the day. And since I was uh, given this education by the Marianists, 
try to use the languages that I studied and forgotten a lot of them, but I have memorized uh, 10 Hail Marys in different languages, so that keeps me uh, pretty alert as I'm going to the university. I can finish a decade in 10 different languages, starting with the order in which I learned them. Mary at the foot of the cross, for example, was, was really central to, to Father Chaminade's thinking. And when you stop and think about that image of Mary at the foot of the cross, here is a woman who is losing her son, and she is at a place where she can do nothing. She, there's nothing that she can do to help him except to be there, you know, and, and I think you know, sometimes in our lives, you know, when, when we're with people and, and in different situations, simply choosing to be present, choosing not to drop out, you know, is the most important thing we can do, you know? It's not like we can come up with an answer to this, a fix it. It's not like we can, you know, mend anything or, or take him down off the cross. But but being present to people's suffering and, and the good times as well as the, the hard times, I, I think that is a, is a wonderful image of, of Mary, and it's, it's something I've come to treasure. Here we are, all together. I think uh, we really need to realize how blessed we are. We've come through some tough times, and yet we're still blessed. We don't know what the future will hold. I think what the call for us now is, and I can say this, as a senior religious, is to bank on our young people. Put our trust in them. They know what they're doing. We got to hand over all of our legacy, our trust, our heritage to them. They've got it. They know what they'll do with it. We're into a whole new world now in this 21st century. I have a lot of trust in them. Myself, I was privileged to live with the novices for a couple of years. Great, great men. I see the seminarians, great men. We've got a great future. Not lots, we don't need lots. Father Shum and I didn't start with lots. But those, the, the people we have are extraordinary, I think. It's hard to let go sometimes. It's hard to trust, but we need, I, myself, I think we need, and sometimes they, the, the young people may be reticent, you young brothers, you may be reticent to take on these roles of leadership. You need to do it. You need to do it. Be generous, be courageous. The Lord will be with you. So my words to the promise would be we're blessed to be happy and let's hand over everything to our younger folks as much as possible.